Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say my guest is John Perkins, which some of you uh, may, may know that name. Uh, he's the author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Uh, he has written many, uh, many books, uh, but that's the one for which he's, he's best known. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Richard. Great to be with you. Okay. Well, I mean, it's been fascinating, I must say, over the last few days delving into your work. And as I say, I first became aware of your work through the, the first the first iteration of uh, Confessions of an, an Economic Hitman. Sometime back, uh, I was then re reacquainted with your work. You've got a new version of, of that book, uh, as well as some of your uh, some of your books on shamanism and so on. Um, so I suppose it's really rounded out for me, my understanding of your worldview, which goes much beyond just the the current ills of our economic system and into a much deeper i suppose meditation on what we can do to address some of of what we're facing now economically ecologically right right yes so perhaps for people who are just getting in into uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about here for, should we start with confessions of an economic hitman i know we've got an hour and i really want to get into the shamanism and, and, and some of the other stuff that you've explored but just to to lay out for people as briefly as you can i suppose your your journey from i suppose a a man in the machine to somebody now actively seeking new ways to to think about our our, our systems and how we organize ourselves Sure, Richard, I think it's probably maybe good to start. Actually, uh, before I was an economic hit, man, I, I, when I graduated from business school, I joined the Peace Corps. <clears throat> and the Peace Corps sent me to deep into the Amazon rainforest of Ecuador. And at one point, I became extremely ill. I was dying. Uh, I, had to, you know, I couldn't get down any food. I, I, I was starving and, and dying. And, and I couldn't walk the very long hike out of the forest to the nearest road and take a rickety old bus for another two days up to the nearest medical doctor. I could barely stand up. <clears throat> Make a long story short, and the longer version is in some of my books, I, uh, a shaman one night uh, healed me, and it was a profound experience. Uh, what happened was on this shamanic journey that he took me on, and one night I, I saw that uh, this, that I'd been raised in <clears throat> New Hampshire, New England, very conservative, New England, uh, the United States. And uh, I, I'd been raised to be very hygienic. We washed our hands a lot. We ate very bland foods. <clears throat> and suddenly here I am living in the rainforest with these indigenous people, the Schwa, who've never seen a bar of soap. And they ate some very strange foods, by, in my opinion, uh, including they don't drink water. Amazonian people don't drink water because they, they know the rivers are not safe to drink because of organic matter that floats in them. Uh, and so they drink something called chicha, which is kind of a beer that's made from women chewing manioc root and spitting it. And then it ferments into this beer. And then they can add water. Spit beer, you know. Uh, I was drinking a lot of spit beer because there wasn't any alternative. <laughs> there was no Perrier. I was drinking a lot of squirming, eating a lot of squirming white grubs and other fascinating foods because there were in cliff bars, you know, and, those, and, and so yeah, I had to eat and drink. But on this shamanic journey, I saw that every time I ate these foods, I'd hear a voice like my mother saying, son, it'll kill you. At the same time, I saw how incredibly healthy the schwa were. And the men what? are all built like Tarzan, you know? And, and so I saw in that one night that it wasn't the food and drink killing me, it was my perception. And so that's, I wanted to tell the story because it kind of sets the framework for everything after that. Right. But, it, but even what you've just, you've just said there, I think for some people are gonna, you, you, there's quite a lot in there, right? You, you talked about a shamanic journey. I'm guessing for some people, they, they won't be sure even what that is. So maybe if you could break that down a bit, to, to give that story you've told just a bit of context. Yeah, well, since then I've studied with, so let me go ahead. So after that, I recovered that night and the next morning I was fine. The shaman then uh, as payment required that I become his apprentice, which I had no desire to do. It was 1968, uh, 69, sorry. Uh, I graduated from business school. I'd never even heard of shamanism. And, and certainly in those days where you couldn't make a living as a shaman. No, no, but there were no shamans in the United States that I know of. 
that's changed. Uh, but he saved my life, so I became his apprentice. And I, I learned, uh, you know, a lot from him. And then after that, later I became an economic hitman. I traveled around the world and I took a lot of time off whenever I could in places like Indonesia and Iran and Egypt and all over Latin America to study with shamans in those places. And so the, the idea of the shamanic journey is, is one that takes you into deep into yourself. We might say it's, it's, it's taking you into your inspiration to be in spirit. You know, and I, as a writer, I know that my best writing is done when I just open myself to, you know, the muses, if you will. Uh, and really the shaman, shamanic journey is that, and it can be done with, by people drumming, it can be done just by sitting in meditation. Uh, it can be done many different ways. In the Amazon, uh, they use a, a plant to help you called ayahuasca, which has now become fairly popular. And in fact, I think it's being misused in a, as a recreational thing almost in many parts of the world today, Europe and, and the United States, England. Uh, but in those days, I'd never even heard of it. Nobody in the United States had. Uh, and it takes you into this, what we call an altered state. Uh, and uh, and in that altered state, that's when I saw uh, that the, the food wasn't killing me, the drink wasn't killing me. It was my mindset, my perception. Well, that as I studied shamanism later on, and, and with this shaman, I, I came to understand that in shamanism, the belief is that there's really uh, two realities. There's the objective reality, the microphone, the camera that we're talking through right now, and there's a perceived reality, and that's really our conversation. And all human institutions, are, all human reality, essentially, is determined by our perceptions of reality. There is no England. There's no United States. There's no religion. There's no culture. Uh, there are no corporations. There's nothing unless, uh, until human beings perceive it. And when enough of us accept a perception or codify it into law, it affects reality. It changes reality. It becomes reality. And that's a very shamanic concept. It's also a concept that's used by psychotherapists around the world these days, and quantum physicists, <laughs> and, 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 and media moguls, and PR executives. Anyway. Yeah, no, but so, 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 so help me understand then. So your perceptions of this food was ma were making you sip. So what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, it, it, I'd hear this, uh, literally, I, 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 inside of me would be this, this, every time I ate these foods or drank this, it would, I would just, it would, it would taste awful, you know, and, and, and I would, I would do it because it's all there was, and, but I, there was this voice within me, with, let's call it a voice, or a knowing within me, a knowing, a, a knowing, which was really a perception, not truly a knowing, a knowing, but that, it was bad for me that it was it was dirty it was you just shouldn't do this you shouldn't drink spit beer i mean somebody spit this stuff to make you know it actually ferments after that it becomes a kind of a beer so it's we we know i know now that it's and I, i've drunk a lot of it in my life i still do i take people into that area every year i'm just about to, to head to the mayan country of, of guatemala next week with a group of people uh and um uh, but uh we know now that, uh, I know now that chicha, which is what the spear is called, is actually, you know, very sanitary because it's alcohol. It, 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 it purifies water. It purif the spit is just as, uh, it sets up, helps set, uh, set up a, a fermentation process. But in those days, it was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. And, and yet I kept doing it. And so it, it created in me this, this mindset uh, that it was killing me. And so, in fact, it was killing me. And I think, you know, we probably all know people who we might call hypochondriacs or, or whatever that uh, are, are believe they're, they're all always sick, and so they always are sick. <laughs> and that is not to say that, that every time you're sick, you, you've caused this to happen, your mind has caused it. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. That's, that's not the case. I mean, there are bacteria, there are viruses, there are things like this. But in, so, in some cases, it's perception. And the bigger issue is that in, when we look at human institutions, they are all created through perception. Our whole economic system, which is failing us so badly right now, and causing climate change and so many other problems, it's a perception of what it means to be successful in economics. And we can talk about that in a, in a few minutes if you want. I can, I can, I'm prepared now to get more into the economic hitman 
idea, but, but it factors into what I just said. So I thought it was important to get that out there first. Right. Yeah, I think it's very important. And it was interesting to me reading that the, the books in sequence, actually, the hitman first, and then, uh, and then the world as, as you dream it, and starting to understand the, the linkages and this, I suppose the dream we have of life and the dreams we have of, of life as Westerners engaged in capitalism and so on, create our world and there are there are alternate dreams for life that we can study and and learn from yeah was yeah, something I, I got well in fact in in my next book which comes out in june you can actually pre-order it now on any of the online uh, houses or bookstores called touching the jaguar which really brings these two together so i've written five books on shamanism and four on global economics and people often say well you're the same guy there's, no really, there's a very strong relationship in this next book touching the jaguar which is a saying from the amazon uh brings them together uh and yeah i mean there's a there's a there's a very strong connection there and if you you look at different lifestyles if you think about human beings we've been human we've called us we, we, we've considered ourselves human for about 200,000 years, maybe a little more. And only out of maybe the, three, the last 3,000 have we been living these lives that say that we need to control nature, we need to maximize short-term benefits. Uh, and uh, you know, we, need to, we, we need to rob the earth, basically, to take its resources and maximize that use. For all the rest of human history, we lived very sustainable lives. And, and the motive was long-term sustainability, not just for ourselves, but for our children, our grandchildren, you know, the famous seventh generation idea. And, and for all of nature, not just for humans, but, but people like, and still in the Amazon and, and in some of these uh, indigenous groups, they still totally believe that, 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 that's, that we have to take care of the long-term. It's not just about the short-term. So it's not just that there are alternative ideas out there, it's that in fact human beings have done something very strange and unusual for a very short period of our history, 3,000 out of 200 and some odd thousand years. Uh, and we all come from indigenous cultures uh, that practice these very sustainable lifestyles. I mean, if, you look at, if you look at the British Isles, for example, where you are, uh, you know, you go back in history and you, you look at, at the cultures that, that lived there then, they were very, very sustainable cultures and they were very much honored the long term, not just the short term. So we have a very strong model to, uh, to revert to. And that does not mean that we need to revert to living in caves or thatched roof houses. It means we move into a whole new concept of what it means to be human on this planet and a new vision of, of a successful economy, moving from what the economists are beginning to call a death economy that we have right now, which is which consumes itself into extinction, into a life economy, which which re, which regenerates destroyed environments and uh, cleans up pollution and pays people to do these things and pays people to create new technologies that don't uh, that don't destroy the planet the planet in the process. Right. Okay, so there's a there's an awful lot in there. Well, one thing that came to me as you were speaking was that the stark difference between seventh seven generations time and the next quarter, <laughs> right? The the time frame that we operate with in capitalism versus those to sustainable cultures. Yeah, and it's not just the next quarter anymore. It's it's today. It's the it's the stock market. What's the stock market doing today? What's what's the stock price of my company doing today? It's it's, it's not even a quarterly thing anymore. Um, it's uh, it's much more immediate than that, right? And okay, so perhaps for, we should we should define briefly then what uh, an economic hitman is, mm -hmm. and perhaps expand from there the, the, the issues. Expand on some of these issues we have with our current capitalist system, and then and then we can dive a little bit more into the shamanism. Yeah. So after I got out of the peace, I was in Ecuador uh, in the Amazon for a couple of years, and then studying and then working with shamans in the high Andes, the Quechua people, for another year. Um, after that, I, I did what I'd been trained to do in business school. I became an economist for a major consulting firm and very quickly rose to chief economist uh, through a series of circumstances and, and ended up having a staff of, of between two and, and, and four, four uh, dozen people working for me. Um, 
And my job was really to use this concept of perception that I learned fr from the from the indigenous from the Schwa people uh, to convince to, to to first of all my, my staff would identify countries that had resources our corporations want like oil. And then my job would be to convince the president or the finance minister or whoever of that country to accept huge loans from the World Bank and its sister organizations. Uh, but the loans would be used to hire our corporations, US corporations, to build huge in infrastructure projects uh, like electrical generating systems and ports, industrial parks, things that made great profits for these for the u.s corporations that built them they they, they made windfall profits off these and would benefit a few wealthy families in those countries the ones who own the industry the industries and the commercial centers who used electricity and could use the ports but the majority of the people suffered because money was diverted from health and education other uh, social services to um, pay the interest on the loans and in the end, the, the principal couldn't be paid down. And so we'd go back under the guise of the International Monetary Fund usually and, and work out a new deal with the country. And that new deal usually meant that they could pay. It was a little easier for them to pay off their debts, but in exchange, they had to sell their resource oil or whatever real cheap to our corporations with no environmental or social regulations. Or they had to sell off their public sector uh, businesses like water and sewage systems and utility companies. Uh, to our investors at very cheap prices, vote with us on the United Nations votes, vote with the United States against Cuba or whatever, allow us to build a military base on this. So these sorts of things, or at least what we call conditionalities uh, that they had to agree to. And, you know, and it was interesting too that in, in the case when presidents or heads of state would not accept these deals, uh, I would remind them of what happened to President Allende of Chile and Arbenz of Guatemala and more recently Zelaya uh, of Honduras just in, the last, just in 2009 and uh, Mossadegh of Iran and Lumumba and Ziem and many other leaders who did not play the game and the jackals, what we call the jackals, were sent in, usually CIA assets who would overthrow or assassinate these leaders. And so really my job was to then go back to my staff and have them create reports that would show that if these investments were made, uh, the economy would grow. And that was a perception that was easy to put across because statistically you can show it happening with the statistics that we use to measure GDP, economic growth. That when you invest in these types of things, the GDP goes up. And so in the early years, I believe that what I was doing was the right thing. I thought I was doing a good thing. It's what I've been trained, been taught in business school to do, and what the World Bank teaches teaches that invest in these things and GDP increases. But over time, I began to see that GDP is a very false measure. It really measures the wealthy. Uh, most of the people in many of these countries don't even make the statistics that you know it's barter service, or they're buying they're buying and selling goods in small local markets that don't get that they don't make the statistics at all. The wealthy people make the statistics. And even today, like in the United States, we know today three individuals have as much wealth as half the, of, the, of the poorest half of the people in the United States. So if those three individuals last year made 10% profit and the half the country that's the poorest lost 2%, we're still going to show a gain of something around 8% in GDP. Mm -hmm. But but that doesn't mean the economy has benefited. It means a few rich people have benefited. And I began to see that this was the case. And so really these statistics are creating a perception. But the reports I was writing were actually using that whole idea of showing the president of the country that by taking on these loans, he could help the economy grow. And then he could use these reports to go out to his people and say, hey, we're taking on these huge loans and a lot of debt. Yes, we're taking on a lot of debt, but our economy is going to grow. We're going to be able to pay off the debt because of the economic growth and so on and so forth, which was, a, was just a perception and, and, and usually a totally false one. It didn't work that way at all. The, the rich did get richer and the poor got poorer. The country didn't do better. And the biggest gain, 
the benefiters of all were our corporations that built the projects. And so, as the story will go on later, that, that, that's, I, that whole idea also gives us the hope that now we can change the perceptions of, and, and get out of this terrible, uh, it's a really a social governmental economic system that's known as a death economy that's, that's ultimately self-destructive. Right. And, and you believe it's, and it's self-destructive because? Because it's based on, on maximizing short-term profits for corporations, for businesses, and essentially it emphasizes short-term gains and benefits for all of us. So, you know, as a young person growing up, but you, you, you're driven to want to have a, a, a better car, let's say. Uh, I was driven in rural New Hampshire. If I could get a really nice car, I, then I could, I, I'd get dates with the best girls, you know, that I wanted to date, that kind of thing. Uh, compete in, in school to go to the best universities and get good enough grades that you can get into a really good corporation. And, and so you can make money so you can buy that, that house and then the next house and so on and so forth. And, and it's this whole cycle of constantly moving into the, it's a short-term view of things for the most part. As individuals, we, we may put money aside in insurance, we may create bank accounts, some of us may, but the majority of the people around the world are not doing that. They can't afford to do that. You know, a large percentage of the world's population can only think about putting food on the table for the next, for the next meal for their kids, and that too is short-term. But the whole, the system that drives all of this is the business system. Our corporations really control our governments. They control, uh, they control life on this planet, as we know it. They control reality through their, the perception that they create, that corporations create. And I'm not trying to paint corporations as bad. They can move in another direction. But they are given the mandate, they say, by their investors, by Wall Street in the United States, by their investors, that they need to maximize short-term uh, stockholder profits that is the mandate that they're given and it's an extremely short-sighted one it means that they the ceo is basically told that during the short term that you're running this company uh gobble up all the resources you can and use them to the maximum benefit of the short-term profit and if that means you've got to essentially bribe politicians and you can bribe them legally by supporting their campaigns at least in the united states we can uh and you know you can create laws that, 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 that destroy the, the environment, that don't protect the environment, that don't protect your workers. Do whatever you need to do to maximize your short-term profits. And that's a very, very destructive uh, guiding principle. And it's actually a very, very new one in human history. Mm. Yes, and <laughs> I, I'm also struck by this idea of you know i want to get the job and get the car to get the date i was i was i was that kid right when i was in my 20s i took a job in a consulting firm in the city in london and it was all about could i get the highest possible starting salary out of university could i get the girl right that was the way to get the girl and i this there's something that so we're all kind of we're all co-opted in this right so i the, these corporations serve me because these these are the dreams that i want to fulfill so i will go to the automobile firm and buy the car and I will buy the clothes and I will buy and I will buy all of that and consume all of that and do what I'm asked to buy the system to get it. And it struck me that in your book, the, the second book, The World is, is As You Dream It, you describe a, a, some, I can't remember the name of the lady, but she's from one of the tribes that you visit. And she talks about, well, we don't measure our people by the, the, the amount of corn in their fields, it's the sunshine in their hearts. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I read that and I thought that's so far, right? That's so far from how we judge each other in the West, or at least I judge others and judge myself. Yes. I'm not looking at myself and saying, oh, you know, am I, am I a happier person today than I was yesterday? Do I have more sunshine in my heart than I did yesterday? Or, you know, am I in a place where I can get the next car I want or the next house or the next, you know, increase in the revenue of, the, of, of my consulting firm? I, so I, I really wrestled with that, right? It, it, it's, so, it's so ingrained in me. And we can look to the corporations and the governments and so on, of course, but there's, it's, it's really in me as well. Well, it's, it's, it's a trap. It's part of what we are, it's, uh, are brought up. You know, our, our universities, uh, our schools, and I think I speak as much for the UK and most of Europe as I do for the United States, and, and it's true in Latin America, it's true throughout most of the world, I think. 
uh, are basically training us to be corporate cogs. And they're training us to get, to get stuck in the system. Uh, I, I recently had a conversation with a young lady um, after a talk I gave, she came up to me and she said, you know, I, I just got my law degree. I, I went to law school and, and I, I did that so that I can become a really conscientious uh, lawyer defending poor people and maybe environmental issues also. But she said, I, I have two, I owe $250,000 to the college. And I, I think in Europe, you've got, in, in England, you've got a very different system and throughout Europe, a lot. but in the United States, this is a real trap. And she said, so I know I'm gonna have to work for a, a big uh, law firm for five years and then I'll pay off my debt and then I'll be able to do what I wanna do. And I said, well, th that's great, but just be careful because in those five years, you may very well fall in love. Uh, you may decide that you want to get married and buy a house and have children <laughs> and buy a couple of cars and you just keep building the debt. And the system works that way, Richard. I think we, and, and I think regardless of the details of whether the college loans or whatever, but the whole system is set up that way throughout most of what we call the, you know, the, the developed world. Uh, and increasingly all over the world, this is whole system. It's, it's, a, it's really a system of, of slavery. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, it's, I, and I, 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 I you know, I, 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 I've already re regretted using that word now because it does certainly doesn't compare with the kind of slavery that, that has happened when people are dragged out of forests and put in chains or when people today are, are yeah, even I was reading today in Africa, there are slave markets and yeah. Yeah. So it's not, but it's a, it's a, it's a different form of slavery. But nonetheless, we are enslaved. We are, we are, we are, we are kept within this system through our own perceptions of what it means to be successful. But you know, increasingly, people are breaking away from that. I have the good fortune, and I'm blessed to have the opportunity because my books have sold several million copies of traveling around the world, and, and they're in many languages and speaking at different kinds of conferences and recently in St. Petersburg, a big international economic forum that Putin spoke at and, and Gutierrez of the United Nations and many amazing people and CEOs and I was a speaker there. And then after that in the Czech Republic at a rock festival <laughs> and, and at universities and all kinds of different venues because I've written these two kinds of books, you know, and everywhere I go, China, uh, all over Latin America, all over the world, all over Europe, people are coming and they're, they're waking up, they're understanding that this system is not working. People are waking up to the fact that we live on a tiny space station, Earth, and we can't get off, and we're heading it toward disaster. Climate change is real, regardless of what the President of the United States and others say, it's happening, the glaciers are melting, there's no question, the oceans are rising, species are going extinct, uh, there's all kinds of statistics, we don't need to hear them, that, that show to us that this system doesn't work. And there's no reason why it should work. If you think about it philosophically, any system that says, I got to maximize short-term use of everything that's around me, including gobbling up all the, the resources around me, it makes no sense ultimately. And it never has made sense to human beings until relatively recently, as I say, in, in our blink of the eye in, in our history, a couple, couple of thousand years. Uh, and so we, we're getting it. People around the world are getting it. And more and more, I'm running into young people and also corporate executives who are opting out, who are saying, you know, this isn't what I want. And there, I see that there are alternatives. And uh, so uh, personally, I have tremendous hope. I, I think we're moving in a very positive direction. And it's moving fairly quickly. I would like to see it move even more quickly. But things have happened in the last five years, the last 10 years, which nobody would have perceived of or conceived of uh, 10, 15 years ago. So what are some of the concrete signs you're seeing of, of, this, of this change? Well, you know, in, in, in the United States, you know, the, the pop, we have a whole political system now that's running around this idea of, the, 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 the green economy, the, the new green economy, the, the, you know, the new green agenda and so on and so forth. Conscious capitalism is a big thing. B corporations, benefit corporations, which define themselves as not being for short-term gain, but for long-term benefits for, for all. Uh, and in August of this past year now, it's 2019, um, 192 of the world's top 
CEOs came together at the what's called the conference board, uh, the, the business board, and 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 came out with a statement that said no longer can our goal be short-term profits. We've got to include in our goals uh, benefits to our employees and to consumers and to the communities where we work. I mean, it was it was a very uh, impressive statement. These are these are top CEOs. Now, they're, they're basically, they said we all need to be benefit corporations. We all need to be B corporations. They haven't done that, but the perception now is out there, and now it's up to us, the consumers, the investors, the employees of those 192 CEOs, to force them to do that. To say, hey, you've made this statement. Now follow through, and they need us to force them to do that. They they need to hear because their consumers, their investors, and their employees saying, yes, yes, we're all for you, and we're only going to buy from you if you actually start to implement policies that reflect this philosophy. Right, and, and, and that sounds wonderful. And I can, I can see that there's, for, for some people, taking a, the activism route works, and obviously there are, very, there are people who are very energetic a- activists out there. But, for, but one thing that appealed to me in, in your books was more this idea of that we, sh- we shift this dream inside of us. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps it's just I just finished reading your, 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 your book today. But yeah, talk a little bit more about this idea of a, of, of a dream that we hold and, and then a collective dream that, that we might hold together and how that may shift things. Well, you know, so this is this indigenous concept that is the world is as you dream it. And, and I was told when, uh, when I was on this, I, this, this uh, shamanic journey that I mentioned that my, I dreamed that the food was killing me. And to change that dream to the food makes me healthy. And in fact, if that food is extremely local and extremely organic and extremely nutritious. Uh, it, it, Even but, that saliva. <laughs> exactly. It really is. You know, I mean, that, it's, it's, this, it's made out of manioc and, and there's a lot of benefits to manioc as a food and it does kill the germs in the water. Uh, we know that <laughs> scientifically. Um, but my dream was that it was killing me. I, the, the word I pers- prefer is perception. The indigenous people talk about the dream because they're, they're, they're a dream culture. They, but um, perception. And um, so what was the question? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's about like, it's about sort of deepening this understanding of what we mean by by a dream. And, and, and in your book, you distinguish it from a fantasy. And I, I get right now you're using the word perception, but the, this idea I think is a powerful one. And yeah. and then also something that this idea that we can share dreams somehow. And and even in one in one fascinating story, you talk about journeying together, where somehow you've you've entered a, a shared altered state. Uh, that you can both reflect on, which sort of blew my mind when I read it. But yeah, I'd, I'd love to, to understand a bit more about that. Okay, so starting with the shared thing, we, we, we actually are all in a sh- the shared dream, or most all of us are in the shared dream of maximizing short-term benefits. That's a dream, that's a perception. It's it's a trance, if you will, that we've, mm. we've all bought into as a, as a community, or most of us, not, not everyone, but a great many people around the world. Um, but if we want to really understand this concept of the dream, and I, I just I wrote a I just recently been writing a newsletter that comes out once a month. It'll come out next two, every Tuesday, the first Tuesday of every month. Your readers can subscribe to it at John. We'll, we'll put a link, yeah. Uh, and it's it's about that very thing that it, 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 Walt Disney said if if you can dream it, you can make it happen. And uh, I think actually it was one of Walt Disney's employees who said that, but. Um, and, and I mentioned this one time at a talk I gave and somebody raised their hand and they said, hey, but if I'm a prisoner in the penitentiary and I dream of getting out early, that's not gonna just happen. And so, and that's a very good point. You have to have the dream and then you have to put, create some actions that make the dream happen. So if the prisoner dreams of getting out early and then says, well, how am I gonna make that happen? Well, maybe I could be an ideal prisoner and get early release. Or maybe I can get my lawyer, get, get, get a good lawyer who can go back and look at the facts and prove that I was innocent. Whatever it is, you come up with a strategy and you take some actions. So every one of us can have a dream and take some action. You know, I was this economist for, for years. And in a way, I, had, I dreamed that. I'd, I'd grown up 
the son of a relatively poor teacher in, in rural New Hampshire, he taught at a boys' private boarding school. I was surrounded by rich kids all my life, but we, my dad didn't make much money. We had a house and food given to us, but that was about it. And I had this dream of traveling around the world and flying first class and staying in the best hotels. I became an economic hitman, and I did that. And then I began eventually to understand that that was really kind of a fantasy. It wasn't really making me happy. It wasn't really what I wanted in life. And so what I really wanted was to be a writer. And ever since I'd been in high school and you know, I was an English major in college, I'd really wanted to be a writer, but I, I hadn't touched that Jaguar. I was afraid to, to put myself out there as a writer. And uh, so I, then, that, then I had the dream, well, I'm gonna be a writer. And, but you can't just dream you're gonna be a writer. You gotta pick up a pen or get a computer. In those days, it was a typewriter and start writing and write something every day, you know, just about every day. So you have the dream and then you take the actions. And sometimes it takes a lot of work to get the actions out there working. But if it's truly a, your dream that you're working on, the work is fun. So writing can be a lot of work. You know, I spend quite a few hours every day working on it, but I love doing it because it truly is my dream. And, and I'm, I'm very happy with that. And I also love traveling around the world, meeting people and speaking out on these issues and talking to you, Richard, right now. I and mean, this is, this is my, this is my dream. And, and it truly is. It's no longer a fantasy. It's, it's truly what I want in life. So a fantasy is something that we think we want. It looks attractive, but we, once it happens to us, we're really not that happy with it. And it's important to distinguish between the two and to give our energy and our actions to the real dream, not to the fantasy. Because if we give them to the fantasy, it happens. It comes true. And we, we get a double whammy because we've also diverted our energies from doing what we really want to do in life. Right. So, okay. And actually, this is fascinating because because a recent uh, well, a few a few guests back now we we had a. Uh, the managing director of a company in the UK, and one of the things she does with her employees when they join is a dream consultation. Mm. And this is where she asks them what their dream is. And then part of the purpose of the company is to have those employees' dreams happen, come true, and they use the, the resources of the company to make the... the oh, that's fantastic. I love that. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. And, and this, by the way, is one of the most successful companies in its sector, of, of course. Well, there, you, there you go. When you asked earlier about some examples that's, uh, of how this is moving forward, that's a, that's a wonderful one right there. Right. And, and so, but as far as I'm and in that conversation, what we didn't talk about was, was entering altered states or you know, the use of, uh, of, 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 of tribal medicine and, 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 and ayahuasca or anything. So, so what's this relationship between what we might understand, I suppose, as, as visioning a future life or something and, and entering altered states? How important is this, this entering of altered states and well, journeying? What is an altered state? You know, I mean, uh, whenever I write, when I do my best writing, I'm in an altered state. It's like uh, 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 Homer, when he wrote the Odyssey, it begins, uh, o, o Muse, you know, he calls on the muse to bring him, to be inspired, to be in spirit. Inspiration means in spirit. Imagination comes from the word, I the magus, I the magician. How do we, so, you know, whenever I write, I'm in an altered state. And there's many ways to do this, and there's many different kinds of shamanic journeys that, that, that take us there, drums, chanting, whatever, just deep meditation it can be, that can take you into that. Uh, these plants that are known now as psychotropic plants, San Pedro, ayahuasca, plants like that are becoming quite popular in many places. They've been used by certain indigenous tribes for thousands of years. The majority of indigenous shamans do not use those sorts of things. Uh, the ones in the Amazon do, and in, a few, in parts of Africa, and they're becoming much more popular today. That they do take, they can take you into that state. I, I say this though with a, a lot of caution because I think in, in the United States and I think in parts of Europe and in, and in the United Kingdom, uh, these are being misused. Uh, people take them too frequently. I, 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 somebody else said to me the other day, hey, I've taken 20, I, I lost it 20 times in the last year. How many times have you taken it? And, and I was trained as an ayahuasca shaman after that experience way back in 1968, 69, 70. And I said, well, the last time I took it was about five years ago. Uh, and I'm still processing that. 
So, I, and I think that's that's a really that's an important aspect of the people who've been taking these things for for, for centuries, millennia, that they understand that you know if this is not a recreational experience, this is not a social experience. Um, we're told that ayahuasca, for example, and San Pedro are not addictive. And maybe they're not physically, but I, I see cases in the at least in the United States where they become addictive socially, where people say, "Hey, there's an mm. ayahuasca weekend next weekend out at such and such a person's farm. Let's all go." And then everybody goes. That's a misuse, in my opinion. So I think we have to be careful. You don't need those plants to to go into altered states or to go into shamanic journeys at all. They are one form of getting there, but there's many different forms. You can do it sitting in your house. I can go into an altar state. In fact, I'm sort of in an altar state whenever I'm doing an interview like this. You can hear it's just kind of rambling. I don't, I don't have anything really prepared. You ask a question, and i like, okay, so spirits, tell me the answer. And they do. <laughs> right. But, but even what you're describing there, yeah, well, not even. You're describing there a call to the spirits to give you answers. Right. Now, for many people listening, that will sound like an altered state. That will sound kind of esoteric and, and strange. And yet, it, it appears, at least from reading the work, this, this is entirely natural. It's, it's a way of living for a lot of people. It is this sense of being, is it, is it something like being in two universes at once? Or what is it's, it you're describing? No, it, it, it's, it's, you can say those things, but... If you think about it, probably everybody that's listening to this has said something like, I think I'll go shopping today. I think I'll go to a movie today. Well, where does that thought come from? Where does a thought come from? Um, that's inspiration. That's being in the spirit. A thought. Where, where, where do you get a thought? If you close your eyes right now and think about your mother or anything, you'll get an image. You can get an image. Well, where did that come from? I mean, is, is there a photograph in your brain? No. There's, where does that come from? We don't know. What we do know is that it's very, very powerful. And, and we, all have, we all are doing that constantly, all the time. Thoughts are coming into us. And sometimes <laughs> you're trying to fall asleep, you may get too many of them, and you try very hard to shut them out. Where are these things coming from? You can say all of that is an altered state, but I think the kind of altered state we're talking about, the shamanic journey, is when the shaman or the pr practitioner is, is actually working to focus those on a certain thing, let's say an objective. Okay, so my objective is I want to envision my next book. I want to come up with an idea for a book, so I go into a meditative state, or maybe I'm beating a drum, or whatever I'm doing. And I just really, really try to focus all the energy of all these thoughts on that idea. But really, more than, I don't want to strain, I want to basically open myself to letting an idea come into me. And I got to say, I mean, that's, I'm doing that all the time as a writer. It's like, I, you know, it's constantly, like I just mentioned, I come up with a newsletter once a month, and I don't have any idea for most of the month before what I'm going to write, but suddenly I hear something on the news or NPR, or I see something going on, and, oh, that would be a good subject. And then I go into this idea and just sort of let, let the ideas come to me around this subject. So this particular time, it was a subject of, of dreaming. I, I, I read someplace that Walt Disney said, if you can dream it, you can make it happen. And I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> I want to pursue this a little bit more. And then I'd, get, I'd given a talk where I mentioned that, and this one person talked about being a prisoner and, and going into that and then saying, well, why, it, well, what does that mean? If a prisoner dreams he, he wants to get out early, does he get out early? And of course not. He's got to do more than dream it, but he's got to start with the dream. The dream, he has yeah. to start with that dream, with that perception. I want to get out early, and I can get out early. All I got to do is convince the authorities that I'm a really good guy. I'm an ideal prisoner that should let me out. I'm no longer a danger to society. Or I really didn't commit that crime, and I got to find someone to help me. Or there's many other possible alternatives that that prisoner could take. Uh, how am I going to dig a tunnel? <laughs> that would be one other one. But the point being that once you get that dream, once you get that idea, then you open to the possibilities of how to make it happen, and then you take the actions to make it happen. Okay. And, and, link, and, and linking this 
to the issues we currently have with our economic systems and our and on environmental or the way that we relate to the environment this is this is something that we we need to focus on this yeah, this sure. to, to become conscious of what we're dreaming yeah and and i know we've only got a few a yeah, I know, I know. so let's get into that so yeah so we've created the death economy this economic system that's that's failing us there's no question about it and it's based on a dream, a perception that, that businesses must, must mas- maximize short-term profits. And now, as we mentioned earlier, that's really a daily thing. What's, the stock, what's my stock doing today? And then it may be taken a little further, may even go out to the next quarter, but it's become more and more short-term. And it's creating tremendous problems. Uh, and so we need to change that dream and really honor businesses that, that maximize long-term benefits for everyone, for their employees, for uh, their investors, yes, and for the communities where they work. Uh, and that's a, that's a relatively old concept. When I went to business school before 1976, that I was taught that, that as a good CEO, you make a decent rate of return for your investors, but you also take good care of your employees and your consumers your customers and your, the, the communities where you were. And then in 1976, a very critical moment, uh, Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize in economics. And he, Milton Friedman made some very good statements, but one, one that you made that I don't believe was so good was that, and probably the most important one, was that the only responsibility of business is to maximize short-term profits. President Reagan bought into that and Margaret Thatcher bought into that and Leaders around the world bought into it, and corporate leaders bought into it. It's now the, the mantra of business schools. It's, what, it's a mantra of businesses. It became that. And it's been catastrophic, what's happened since. And so, but it's just a perception that the, the business of business is to maximize short-term profits. So now we need to turn that around and say, no, no, no. The business of business is to create a long-term future for all of us and our children and grandchildren. And and that means for all species. What are our children without trees or flowers or, or plant or animals? And so uh, we turn that around to saying that the success stories, the people who are going to make the covers of the Financial Times, the front page of the Financial Times, or uh, Time Magazine, or the or Fortune Magazine, or any of these places, these are going to be the executives that are leading the way toward creating a life economy. And as I said earlier, we, we, it's, there's a huge moving in that direction amongst top, some of the top CEOs. And I hear it all the time, Richard, when I give talks to, to corporate executives, often afterwards at a reception over a glass of wine or something, uh, one of them will say to me, hey, you know, I really want my company to do the right thing. I get grandchildren. I want to have, have my company be more environmentally and socially conscious. But I'm afraid that if I, if I do that, I'll lose, in the short term, I'll lose stock prices or market share. And if that happens, it's likely that my top investors will get me fired and replaced by someone who only cares about the short term. And so please go out there and send a message to all your readers and other people that they need to let me know. And so each one of us, Richard, can do that. Through our incredible social networking circles that we all have these days, all we got to do is say, hey, send a, send a, to all of our friends and say, hey, please repeat this and send to comp- this company, send to, send to Nike a, uh, an email, a, a tweet saying, I love your shoes, but I'm not going to buy them anymore until you pay your workers in Indonesia a living wage. And it, when, when, when the CEO of Nike, who's, whose name is Mark Parker, and is one of the people who's actually mentioned this to me, that he wants to receive these kinds of things. And... Uh, and he can take that he has 100,000 of these tweets that he can take to his executive committee and say, these are our customers. We've got to listen to them. We've got to move into a new era. Let's us be the leaders in that era. And it's happening. It's happening, Richard. And it's, but all of us, it behooves all of us to make it happen faster. It's up to us. Democracy is about us making it happen. Our leaders cannot do it on their own. They can make the statement as those 192 did, but we, the consumers and the employees and the investors need to push them and, and let them know. And, and it's interesting, actually, that I think what you're talking about there and the fact that you focused on executives rather than politicians is probably telling because 
they have perhaps more power in in many cases than our politicians do. So if we're going to lobby anyone, perhaps it is often the corporate ex executives. Yeah, we need to lobby yeah. both of them. But the politicians very much answer to the business to, to the big money, the corporate executives. They, they very right. much do, and they often exchange jobs. You know, so you know, yeah. we had several presidents of the United States recently who came out of the oil industry, the Bush, the Bush family, for example. Uh, and uh, now we've got uh, a president of the United States who's, who's a real estate mogul, sort of. Yeah. And then the other, and I know we've got to close this out. It, it feels like there's so many big ideas in, in, in what, what you've, you've written. But one of the things you talk about, which also really struck me, was this idea of, of moving from an earth dominating culture to an earth, um, to an earth honoring culture. Yes. And yes. that's something as well. I, you know, I'm going to take some time to, to meditate on myself. Is well okay. So clearly, that has implications for the business world. But for me, what, what does a an earth honouring Richard Atherton look like versus an earth dominating Richard Atherton? And uh, that's an interesting question for me to wrestle with. Yeah, and I think each of us as individuals need to look at what we each can do and want to do. So I think you like to do these podcasts. So earth an earth honouring Richard for you is one who continues to do podcasts that really focus on this and bring on other people that can talk about these things. For me, it's writing books about it. If, if one of your listeners is a carpenter, it's using sustainable materials and telling your clients that you're using sustainable materials and, and, and saying, hey, maybe it seems to be costing you a little bit more, but that's not a cost. That's an investment in the future. Whether you're a plumber, whether you're a, 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 a parent, we, we all can do. So we need to do what we, we love to do most. We need to follow our heart, our bliss. We need to do what we love to do and orient that in some way toward, uh, toward creating this life economy. I love to write, but I don't write anything anymore that doesn't go in that direction. Right now I'm working on some short stories and some fiction, but they also move toward in that direction. And I think we can all do that. And I, yeah, I would love to continue this conversation more. So pre-order uh, Touching the Jaguar. You can order it today and it comes out in June and let's get back together after that. And I'd love to talk. To Brilliant. Someone. Yeah. That, that makes this conversation a lot easier, really, because my attempt in there was to explain a lot of the things we've talked about and to connect the shamanic with the, with the, uh, with the corporate, with the economic. Yes, it does feel like, you know, we've got a couple of hours we could, we could go here. But thank you so much. We'll put those links in the description of the show. I'll let you get to your next, uh, your next engagement. But and John please, Perkins, thanks again. Wonderful conversation. You're welcome. And thank you for all you do, Richard. Talk to you. Thank we'll you. talk to you in June or July. Let's do that. Okay, awesome.